So please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. We're continuing with our series on the book of 1 Samuel. And so, um, before we do that, we read this portion of the scripture. Let me give you a, a little... Uh, summary of what's going on in the story let me set up my time first okay so um what do we have here now so as you remember david was given saul's daughter as a wife mika right and so but the main, the main thing that is happening now is that David has been anointed by God to be the king of Israel. But there is something interesting going on, is that Saul is still the king. So what's happening here? What's, why, is, why has David been anointed? And we have to go back even, you know, in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, which we already covered, was that Saul, the problem with Saul is that he was trying to build his own kingdom. Okay? He was seeking his own power. Do we see that in our daily lives? You know, we have politicians uh, who are supposed to serve the people. And... Uh, I don't want to generalize, obviously, because I believe there's good, good men in politics, right? Um, but there's always that temptation to build your own empire. You know, we, we like power. I mean, if you don't like power, maybe there's something wrong with you. I mean, we all, you know, let's be honest, we, we want control. We want power. I do sometimes. I'm not going to lie. But then I have, to be bring, I have to be brought back to scriptures and be reminded that the Lord has called me to serve, but not to be served. And so, so David is being anointed because of God's desire, but obviously was because of Saul's constant disobedience, his longing for power. And so Saul disobeyed God so many times. And so in, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, we see David being anointed. And from that point on, you will see that God is with David. The Spirit of God rushed upon David. And he abandoned, God abandoned the Spirit of God abandoned Saul because of his disobedience. So, uh, now in this part of the story, we'll see what's happening now. So let's read together 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. This is the word of the Lord. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. I got lost for a moment. And I, in, in, I'm sorry, in verse 3, and if I learn anything, I will tell you. Verse 4, and Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoice. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without, without cause? 
And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, Saul's sword. As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Please, Father, speak through me to my dear brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, Lord. This is your word, not mine. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, growing up in Peru as the, fa- as the son of a, of a pastor wasn't easy. You know, in general, um, I have great sympathy for pastor's kids. So every time I see Adam and Asher, my own kids, I kind of see myself there, you know, years back. That was one of, you know, that was me, you know, when I was growing up. And let me tell you something. Being a pastor's kid was not easy at all. Because you have this sense that you cannot make mistakes. Even if you try hard, you know, it's always, okay, my dad is a pastor, you know. I don't want my dad to lose his job, so I, want, I, have, to perf- I have to do well. And so there is a sense of pressure on you, right? And I, I felt that pressure growing up in Peru as, because my dad, as many of you know, was a Presbyterian minister there in Lima. He worked with Mission to the World, for Mission to the World there as a, as a local pastor with American missionaries planting churches in Lima and other parts of Peru. And so, you know, going to church, I mean, I enjoy going to church. I really enjoy being part of the youth group and all that, but still there is that pressure, you know. In high school, my friends, they knew I was a pastor's kid, and, you know, you know the, the jokes and all that. And, you know, I can, I can take a joke, you know. It's okay. I don't, I'm fine. But then, you know, then... Uh, uh, but still, you know, even my teachers, my professors during high school, they were, uh, oh, you're the pastor's kid. So, you know, they, they would joke sometimes with me, but sometimes they were actually serious, you know. Say, hey, you're the last person to be, you know, misbehaving. You're a pastor's kid. So watch out. I'll tell your dad. So I had to live with that. <laughs> so anyways, and, you know, sometimes uh, as growing up, and it was hard, but also I didn't help the situation. I was a very mischievous kid growing up. So I have a younger brother, and everybody thought that he was going to be the pastor, my dad's successor, right? Because there is this thing in, in evangelical families in Peru, at least, that if your dad is a pastor, the son most likely has to be a pastor too. And so everybody thought that my brother Miguel, my younger brother, man, he, uh, he did great in school. He was always well-behaved. He was a, a very good listener and all that. And I was the other side of the coin, you know. And, uh, and yeah, especially my sophomore and junior year in, of high school, I really struggled. I was already a believer, but still, I was really struggling. I was very rebellious even sarcastic about God's word. And then when I would get in trouble, my mother, my dear mother, would be the one defending me when it comes, when it came to discipline. When my dad, when my father was going to, to, you know, to to let me know how it is, to correct me, my mom would always talk to him, to calm him down. Nelson, my dad's name is Nelson, please remember how you were when you were growing up too. You know, and remember, he's, he's your son. I will always remember my mom, my mom saying that to my dad. Remember that he's your son. You know, and then you can say, you know, you can tell him my dad was building up, you know, this anger. You know, he was, uh, and then my mom would come and say some words to calm his heart down. And for the most part, it really worked. Because my mom would even quote the scripture. <laughs> You know, you, you, he, he would, he, my mom would quote the scripture to my dad. And they, I was like, Mom, please keep going. Keep reciting Bible verses. You know, I, I need your help. And so my mom really had this power of persuasion. 
And so why what we have in this story is that David is in trouble. And, uh, well, this is, he's not going to get spanking. This is worse than that. His, his life is at risk. His life is at risk. And uh, he needs help. And so we'll see what, what happened in this portion, which I already read. But the, the, the main problem, too, is that it's Saul. You know, David is innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong against Saul. But then Saul started to, to, see, he, he started to see that everybody started loving David. You know, he, every time when he saw David, when he heard about David, everything was great. Every, everything was worshiping. Uh, it, it sounded like he, they were worshiping David because even the women there, would, you know, they, were, they went crazy about David. They would sing songs about David. Every battle David was involved, he would win. He was always winning. Why? Because God was with him. First Samuel 16, remember, he has been anointed. And so this created this jealousy within Saul. Then this jealousy turned into anger. And this anger turned into these thoughts of planning, basically, the assassination of David. Do we struggle with jealousy? Well, pastor, you know, sometimes I envy people, you know, but it's okay. I mean, I'm not, I don't wish them to be dead. You know, it's, it's, it's a healthy jealousy, we say sometimes, right? <laughs> and yeah, you, you can say that. I mean, it's a healthy jealousy. You know, he's doing great. That somebody, maybe a co-worker or a family member or a brother or sister are doing great. But, you know, that's the beginning. That's the start. Oh, it's a... It's, uh, this jealousy that I have against this, uh, these guys, uh, it's no big deal. I mean, you know. Look what happened in Genesis 3, verses... In Genesis 4, excuse me, verses 3 through 8. It's basically that Cain, remember Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, he is starting to have this jealousy. And this jealousy turns into anger and anger into murder. And so jealousy was the seed of everything, of this, of this outrageous act, the first assassination of a human being, Genesis 4. So I want to warn you this morning that if you're struggling with jealousy, that you bring that before the throne of God to put that to death. Because that jealousy turns into anger. And this anger turns into even wishing that this person, something horrible happens to this person. Yeah, I won't kill this person, but still, you know, if he has a car accident or if he gets cancer, ah, okay, great. I haven't done anything. I didn't cause that cancer to happen to this person. But deep in our hearts, we're like, yeah, that's what she deserves. That's what he deserves. That's what you get for being the way you are. Please, Lord, save me from those thoughts. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 21, 22, in the Gospel of Matthew, says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Mm. Let's take this jealousy that we may have really seriously. You see what happens next to Saul. Now Saul is seeking to destroy David. So the first point of this sermon is, so the, the main idea that I want you to, to, to really keep in, in mind is that God is with David. Not for a short period, but forever. Okay? But that doesn't mean that David will not have struggles. 
and you see, if you see the, the life of David, you will see, oh man, yeah, is God really with him? Yes, God is with him. But that doesn't mean that he will not have struggles. And so the first point of this sermon is that our daily struggles, is that we all have struggles every day with family members, with co-workers, with ourselves, you know, struggling with this jealousy that we may have. So we must bring this jealousy to, to the throne of God. So, and also, keep this in mind, is that the world is watching. The world is watching. How do you express yourself about other people? You know, we, we don't have a, a blank check when it comes to, to speaking of our rivals. It could be in sports, it could be in, I don't know, politics. You know, we don't have a blank check that you can basically, you know, just trash that person. Even if that person is an evil person, right? We don't repay evil with evil. We have to keep that in mind. So our daily struggles, where are your daily struggles? Let's bring that before the Lord. And so the struggles that we see here is, is, in David is that, yeah, he's innocent, and people are actually now attacking him, in this case Saul. He's seeking his death, okay? And so now Saul has this, 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 this brilliant, we saw this in, in chapter 18, this brilliant plan of sending David in an undercover operation. To, to get, to kill 100 Philistines, right? To, to kill 100 Philistines. And, and in order for him to get married to uh, Mika, he has to bring 100 foreskins of the Philistines that he killed. And so David goes. And so the, the main point was not really for, uh, you know, that, he, that Saul wanted the Philistines to dead, but the, the, the main point, the main objective of this undercover operation was to have David killed. And remember, God is with David. And what happens then? You saw what happened, right? So David went to kill these Philistines. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do your work. You're the king. You're supposed to tell me what to do. You know, I receive orders, uh, military men. And then David goes there and he brought how many foreskins? 200. It's very clear that God is with David. Even in the battlefield. Let's move on to the second point. Our daily provision. So, even in the midst of chaos, even when David was fearing for his life, God provides for him. How did he provide for him? With Jonathan. With Jonathan. So who was Jonathan? Remember, Jonathan made a covenant with David. Jonathan and David were basically like brothers. They were knit together. Soul and heart. True friendship. Okay? And, and, and you, I want you to see the goodness of God because, because since God is with David, it's not just, oh, I'm just going to be next to you, but I'm going to provide for you. And he provides who? An ordinary Israelite of his time? No, he provided the very best. And the very best in this case is Jonathan because Jonathan is the son of Saul, the son of the king. When God provides brothers and sisters, He provides the very best. Remember, Jonathan is not an ordinary citizen of Israel. He is the son of the king, the very flesh and blood of Saul. Who better than him to persuade, intercede for David? Huh? Have you thought about that? God didn't use another military man to, to persuade Saul from killing David. He provided the very best, best 
person to persuade king, the king, Saul. In this case, his very son. And so, that's great, right? But so how are you going to convince the king from killing David? Because, you know, Saul, he has been consumed by jealousy, by anger. He can take it anymore. You know, before, you know, I'm going to send David in this uh, undercover operation, so hopefully the Philistines will kill him, and then the plan didn't work out. So now forget about it. I'm just going to go for it. So he says, Saul says, to anybody, any commander that he has, kill David. I want David's head. Bring it to me. And so Jonathan heard. And then God again, God is with David. So God provides David with the very best person to intercede for him in this story. And that's Jonathan. And so Jonathan goes and approaches Saul. And I want you to, to see these three things about Jonathan, okay? These three significant things, reasons why 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 what Jonathan did was so important. Number one is that this is very significant because Jonathan sought peace, sought reconciliation between these two parties, the guilty party and the innocent party, right? So Jonathan was, was, was trying to appease the anger of the king, his dad. And so he, he goes and confronts Saul, in the open field. And you know, I have heard pastors that even suggest that this is a great way to evangelize people. You know, you go there and you don't, you know, lecture people in front of everybody, right? But you confront people in, a, in, a, in the right setting. It says here in the open field. You know, when you're going to go and see, tell somebody about their mistakes or about their sins, you don't tell that, you don't bring, hey, buddy, come here. I'm going to lecture you in front of the congregation. You know, you're a really horrible man. And you need to repent about this, 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 and that. You know, we, we can't do that, <laughs> right? We know better. I mean, you know, and, and so uh, even the Bible says, if your brother sins again, you know, go and, you know, go one-on-one. -on -one and you, you, you know what to do. I mean, this is not new to you if you have been in the church for a long time. Matthew 18. And so you see this example of Jonathan, of even of confrontation. He goes to the open fields and confronts King Saul with his sin. And he says, Dad, you know, you, I know you want to kill David, right? But why? What has he done to you? He even worked for you. Everything you have said as of him, he has done it. But there is a reason too there. Is that Jonathan did not want his dad to commit a grievous sin, which is was the shed of innocent blood. So even God was so kind to Saul by sending Jonathan to speak sense to him. You see the, the, the goodness of God even there? To go to Saul, who was rebellious and disobedient to God. And even in there, God sends Jonathan to speak sense to his dad. Man, God is good, brothers and sisters. He uses people, even family members, or the less person that you can imagine to speak truth to you. That's the goodness of God. That he uses Jonathan... <laughs> To persuade his father, you know, Dad, you're going to commit a, a horrible sin. This is bad. You're going to sin against God. And so they, Jonathan was successful. We see that. Right? So that's one reason why, what, why Jonathan, what he did was, was very significant. It was because he went to make made peace there and he was successful. Right? We see in verse 7 that even uh, uh, Saul swore, yeah, I'm not going to touch this man. So Jonathan persuaded his dad in, in God's sovereignty and providence. Right? So, okay, so, and the second point that he's, he, he, he is, he, this is significant about Jonathan is because, think about it. He's giving up power 
Jonathan was the son of the king. So automatically in your head, you know, let's do the math. Okay, he's the king, he has a son. Therefore, when the king is gone, who's going to be the king? Jonathan. So Jonathan is giving up power. He is on David's side. Why? Because Jonathan knows that David has been anointed by God. Jonathan, he gets it. It's not about building my own kingdom. We have many pastors out there in the world who want to build their own kingdom. And I have nothing, please, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I have nothing wrong with, with pastors that preach on television or have, you know, famous podcasts or, you know, nationwide. I'm, I'm nothing against that. But we also have to examine our hearts. Okay? So, I don't want, you know, he must increase and I must decrease. John the Baptist, right? So, Jonathan gets it. It's not about my dad's kingdom. It's about his kingdom. It's about his purposes. It's about his plan. You see? God has anointed David. First Samuel 16. And Jonathan knows that. And so I'm going to give up my power. It's all about God. It's not even about David. It's about God's plan. Whose kingdom are you building? Oh, well, well, Pastor Paulo, we need this man in, in power so, you know, he can bless us. Well, you know, we all have the right to vote. Praise God for that. We have the freedom in this country to do that. But I'm not going to build anybody's kingdom. I'm not, I'm not, I have not been recruited by God to build a human being's kingdom. I have been recruited by God. I have been called, purchased by Christ to build, to help, to help building his kingdom. Which, by the way, he doesn't need me, but still, he invites me to be a part of it. It's about building his kingdom, not my kingdom or my leader's kingdom, but God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom. And number three, you know, he gave up, so he sought peace, he was successful. Number two, he was, he gave up power, Jonathan. The number three, he was, he could have been accused of treason. He was basically risking, risking his life. Can you imagine if, if Saul find, found out that, you know, he was going to tell, you know, David about all these things, he, which, by the way, he already told, told him what's happening, the, all this plot against him. So imagine that. So if he got caught, he could have, left, you know, lost his life. Jonathan was risking everything here. But again, our daily provision you see the goodness of God providing for King David, his anointed one. I'm going to provide for you the very best. The sons, the king of the sun to advocate for you. This is a sermon of this, the, the title of this sermon is the, Our Greatest Advocate. God is with David. Get that, let's get this together in our head. God is with David. Therefore, he's going to provide for him. And so, so what about us? I mean, how, how does this have to do with us, right? The next question. So what? <laughs> that sounds great, you know, good. Good for David. Yay. But so, I'm really struggling right now with my life. Here in Davidson County, you can say that, right? Uh, I'm about to lose my job, or I'm struggling financially, or my marriage is in crisis. My daughters and sons are, re are rebellious against me. I, I don't get along with my kids. I'm struggling with cancer, or, you know. So what does this have to do with me, Pastor Pablo? 
I don't get it. And that's a legitimate question. Our daily provision. Why our daily provision? Because this text is going to remind us, is going to point us of our greatest advocate. Who is this greatest advocate? Is Christ. Jesus Christ. And, and, and you know, we have to, to, to get this, this right. Is that God in Christ provided the very best also for us. Okay? Christ is far better than Jonathan because his interceding for us is everlasting. It's not successfully temporary. Because you see what happens chapters later. Did Saul kept his ought, his promise? No. He went after him. Again, he wanted David dead. So Jonathan was successfully, but only for a, for a, pe a short period of time. But then you have Christ, who is successful. Jesus Christ saw out on the cross. It is finished. Because that transaction, that, that in the Greek, is the, the language of transaction. This debt that we had with God, Jesus paid it on the cross, and that's why he cries out, it is finished. The debt is fully paid. And so, we have this great advocate in Christ. And here's, here's another thing I want you to take with you this morning, is that Jesus is not just with us. You know, Matthew 20, I will be with you until the end of the world. But I am going to be working for you. <laughs> Jesus is working on your behalf. So if you have committed sins in your life this week, and you really feel beat up this morning, like, man, I don't really deserve to be here. And we even have the, Lord, the Lord's Supper. How am I going to take this? This is so much. I, I'm, a, I'm a failure. I keep doing the same thing over and over again. I don't deserve this. That was me when I was growing up as a pastor's kid. Every time there was Lord's Supper, I would cry in the back of the church because I felt unworthy. And I really didn't get it though. God provides the very best. And I have to keep that in mind. You are not the very best, Pablo. You are not the very best. But you have somebody far better than you. And this is Christ. So Christ is, is, is with you and he's working for you. Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Mm. Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding. You see the gerund? Interceding. He's doing it right now for us. His power of interceding for on our behalf is much greater than Jonathan's interceding abilities. So that is why this text reminds us, this text is important for us because it points us to our greatest advocate. And so you're struggling about being worthy, 
Just remember, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are more than worthy. And the question is, how is God Christ interceding for us? How is he doing that on our behalf? Is he begging God, God, please forgive Pastor Pablo. He doesn't know anything. Please forgive him. Just give him another chance. I will grant him some grace. You know, let's give him another chance. No, that's not what's happening in heaven. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what's happening in heaven. All the things that had Jesus has to do for us to intercede is, yes, when God the Father looks at him and he sees the marks of the cross. He sees the wounds of Christ. So Jesus Christ is an everlasting reminder that the debt that we owe has been fully paid. Every time God the Father sees God the Son, Jesus, He remembers what He has done for us. He just didn't die for us, but He lived the perfect life. He fulfilled the covenant of works that Adam and Eve and us failed. You see, Jesus' perfect obedience and perfect sacrifice on the cross is more than enough for you and I. So let's just stop beating ourselves up. In Christ, we have the perfect, righteous, holy, beloved, begotten Son of God interceding on our behalf. That's God's provision. The very best. But we forget. Let's not forget that. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was not cheap. It has tremendous consequences for our daily lives. And the brother just brings us to my last point, which is our daily calling. So, we struggle with life with sins done by us or sins done against us, like in David's case. But we have to be clear here, okay? Before we move on really quickly to the, to the, to the, the third point, is that, you know, I'm not trying to say that Saul is, is God in this, you know, this, these parallelisms that we see here. No, Saul was an evil king. God, on the other hand, is a kind, good king who always provides the best okay and then we are not really like david here in this in this story because we are actually guilty <laughs> you know we we have all fell short from the glory of god so we are actually guilty and we deserve death but because of your faith in christ which by the way is a gift from god to you ephesians 2 because of this faith that you have in Christ, you are declared righteous. Because of his righteousness, because of Jesus' righteousness. Therefore, there's no longer condemnation for you. So, okay, so that will move us, that will motivate us to do our daily calling. And what's our daily calling? Your daily calling is to make disciples. It's to shine Matthew 5, 14. We must shine in the world. Are we shining in the world? What are you known for in Lexington? What are these traits that your family sees in you that, oh, that's, that's my dad. Oh, yeah, that's my sister. Oh, yeah, that's me, right? Remember, we don't have a blank check. Which, whatever, which means we can do whatever we want. No. Christianity, following Christ, doesn't work that way. Oh, pastor, he's a bad person. I can, you know, just trash this person whenever I want. No, no, it doesn't work that way. We're supposed to shine, to speak truth in love and compassion. Is it because you're a Christian? Yes, because you're a Christian, but... Also, because you are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. 
So let's live up to that. You are royalty. You are not just an ordinary person in the world. You have been purchased by blood by Christ. You are daily called to obedience. To live as daughters and sons of a king. Because you are. And the king is not going to give up on you. But the king wants you to follow him. Even when it's very uncomfortable, uncomfortable to follow him. Even when it's very hard to do what's right. You are not an ordinary person if you're in Christ. You have been purchased by Christ on the cross. Therefore, let's live as kings, as kings' daughters and sons. Let's set the example in the world. How are you known in the coffee shop? You know, many of us go to a coffee shop, right? So the people in the coffee shop, do, can they tell the difference that you're a Christian? No, I'm not saying because they, 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 they hear you, the, 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 the Christian, you know, words, you know. It's because in your daily life, do they, can, they, can the people in the world tell the difference between you and a non-Christian? If you're a student in high school or in college, can they tell the difference? Can I tell the difference that you belong to a king? Can I tell the difference that I, as a pastor, am a Christian? Or do I act with the instruments of the world, even as a pastor? You know, I'm not saying, you know, you have to live in a monastery or, you know, be a monk or, you know, something like that. You know, we're, we're not called to, to be, you know, hidden in, in, underground or in, in an old building. No, we're called to be out in the world and to shine. But we shine, we have the power to do that because or of, our, of our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of him, of the king of kings. And we have that power because the Spirit of God dwells within us. We have been provided, we have been provided with the best of the best. So in your struggles when you pray, just keep that in mind. Romans 8, Hebrews 7, He lives to intercede for you. Let's pray.